Hang on, somebody's shouting outside. Hello and welcome to It'll Be Alright in the 90s, the podcast that when it plays in goal insists on wearing long sleeves with padded elbows and shoulders, the same shorts and socks as the outfield players and strictly the numbers 1 or 13. I'm your host Alex and joining me is my co-host Stu Joslin. Stu, what were you wearing in goal at Pride Park last week? Oh, I actually wore a Derby County shirt which had been prepared. Um, I did take my own kit with the course number one on the back, padded elbows etc. Mm. It was a short sleeve Derby County shirt, I had to make that concession. Um, but I thought I looked pretty, uh, pretty good in it, D- didn't you? Have, you? have you seen the pictures? I've seen the pictures and you definitely looked apart. Yeah, absolutely. How was it? How did it go? Uh, yeah, absolutely brilliant experience. So for any listeners that don't know, um, I got the opportunity last week to go and play in goal at Pride Park, uh, home of Derby County. And it was brilliant. We, my team didn't end up on the winning side. Unfortunately, you might expect that with me being in goal. But, but such a great experience to play at such a, a big stadium and, and get to use the pitch and the dressing rooms and, and see how it all works on a, on a match day there was, uh, was absolutely fantastic. So hopefully I've done enough to earn a call up to the next trip that gets organised uh, and, th- and there's more in the pipeline. But yeah, uh, a, a great, great experience. I'm just sorry that I didn't get to do any field recordings uh, for the pod because we were, uh, you know, we were having to rush a bit. There was a game on after us and we had to, uh, you know, we had to shower and, and be out pretty sharpish afterwards. So I do apologise about that. But uh, yeah, what a great experience. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Sounds sounds like a great day. And you can't always concentrate on on content, can you? Sometimes you've just got to focus on, on what's happening um, aside well, from that. So. You're quite right. I mean, you know me, though, content first in all things. But um, but, but you are right. Sometimes, uh, you know, other other items have to take over. And that, that was definitely one of those days. But maybe next time, if we, we've got a bit more time on our hands in the stadium, whichever one we do next, if I'm invited along again, um, then I'll try and get some recordings from there. Yeah, fantastic. Well, we are both sat here in different goalkeeper jerseys, aren't we, Stu? Uh, you have a what season of Aston Villa is that? Uh, this is the 95 to 97 Aston Villa away goalkeeper top, the uh, yellow and green. Absolutely and... resplendent. On, oh, thank on you very much. There. And what have you got? I've got a cheap knockoff Jorge Campos um, <laughs> goalkeeper shot. I mean, I can't say home or away because he just he just wore every one. I think he I think. did. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, just something I found on eBay a few years back, and uh, I thought I'd pop on for today's episode because, of course, we are talking about goalkeeping in the nineties with a very special guest who will be joining us in a little bit. Um, but before we get to that, today's pod sponsor is Adams Clothing Stores. So we know that many of our listeners are children of the 90s, which as the way because of the way time works means a lot of you will maybe have children of your own. So this mm-hmm. will be a perfect sponsor for you. So you can go down to your local branch of Adams and quote the code all right 90s to get 10% off their new summer range, including swimming gear and sunglasses. So that's today's sponsor, Adams Clothing. Brilliant. Thanks so much to Adams for, for helping us out tonight. I used to get a lot of stuff from Adams back in the day. I think I might have been almost exclusively kitted out by by Adams and Ladybird as well. Uh, oh. Was Ladybird part of Woolworths? I think it might have Something been like that. Yeah, the, the Woolworths clothing range. But yeah, very very familiar with Adams and their and their products as a as a young lad. So very very uh, pleased to have them on board. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Adams. We're not just talking about goalkeepers today, are we? Because it is our second birthday, or it was it our indeed. second birthday, I should say. Yes, two years on the air. Who would have thought it? Um, I've enjoyed every second of broadcasting with you, mate, and connecting with our with our wonderful listeners. And I hope for at least two more years. I don't think that's too much to ask for. Um, but yes, another birthday rolls round, and as is the tradition on these occasions, um, we've dipped into the the pod petty cash and, and bought each other some gifts, haven't we? We have indeed. Yes, we've uh, trawled the internet and the the flea markets and our local high streets to find something ninety steamed for each other, and. Uh, I had it sent over to each other, so I have my two packages here next to me, um, and hopefully you've got a couple of things there as well. I have two packages here, yes, one of which, uh, enigmatically, is addressed to both of us. Uh, <laughs> right. It says Alex Greenwood and then the floozy from Pusey on the on the envelope. Uh, oh, so right, there yeah. you go. There you Just go. Belt, belt and braces there. <laughs> I can confirm that is for you, not for me. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to go ahead and open your, well, either of them? Whichever I'd love rather. to. Um, I'll go with the 
I'll go with the smaller profile envelope first, um, mm -hmm. which appears to have come all the way from Northern Ireland. So wow. very much looking forward to finding out what's in here. Uh, let's have a look. And there isn't, gonna, there's not a, a, as much packaging in, involved as last time as well. Uh, oh, so there won't be a lot of editing you have to do while I try and get through <laughs> layers of paper and tape. Yeah. What have we got here? Oh, <laughs> oh, that's amazing. For my lunchbox at school. Exactly. Uh, it's uh, it's a John Abrell uh, Premier League 97 uh, Merlin sticker. Uh, do you want me to read out the fact about him on the back of the Please sticker? Do. Please this do. is number 173. Uh, midfield anchor man playing in front of the back four. Good at breaking down opposition moves and initiating attacks. He's no stranger to the score sheet. England honours at every level except full international. Uh, oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I genuinely will stick that on my... Uh, on my work lunchbox, so to yes. remind me of, a, of a, such a momentous day. Thank you so much. I really appreciate no worries. that. I was hoping that's what it would be used for. That's lovely. And whoever sent it has mm. um, has packed the envelope with a cut down part of a Sainsbury's uh, cereal box, whole grain wheat flakes fortified with vitamins and iron with sultana, sweetened banana chips, coconut chips, dried apple pieces and roasted hazelnut pieces. So whoever sent this eats well as well, which is good to yeah. know. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks for that. Right, I'm opening my first package with resplendent with... Uh, it's the second time I've used the word resplendent on this <laughs> episode. Uh, what was it some, last time? Bucolic. Uh, bucolic was the word of the last episode, yeah, it's true. Um, so this was this is arrived from um, Grantley Drive in Birmingham. Seems to be some sort of print. Oh, that is fantastic. So that this, is from direct from one of the press rooms at USA 94, that is a genuine team sheet that was circulated in the press box. Oh, you have to remind me what game it is. Is it, is that it Brazil? That is tremendous. It's Brazil Romania. Romania, one of my favourite teams of World Cup 94 uh, against Sweden. Romania, Sweden. Some absolutely huge names on here. I mean, Stu, you've actually you've got me a genuine team sheet from my favourite World Cup that actually has Georgie Hadji on it. That is absolutely sensational. It's our second birthday. You deserve nothing less. Oh, that is fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, that's going straight in the frame. Oh, please do like it. I am. There, there, were, there were a few to choose from. And yeah, the genuine. There should, I think there are some staple holes in the in the top corner, one of the top corners, which um, which speaks to the fact that it was uh, stapled in with a lot of other stuff um, and, yeah. and passed around the, 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 the press room at the Pasadena Rose Bowl or whichever stadium it, it happened to be to be uh, set at. So yeah, no, I'm at, glad you like it. Oh no, absolutely! It was played at uh, San Francisco Stanford Stadium on the ah. 10th of July, uh, eight days before my ninth birthday, at 12:30 in the afternoon. Absolutely brilliant! Thank you. I'm pleased you like it. I am pleased you like it. Um, right. What's your right. second? I'll go for my second one. Here we go. There might be a little bit of editing here. This is a no, here we go. all right. We have got oh, it's a it's a pennant of some sort. No way. <laughs> oh, mate, that is amazing. Wow, you've just done to me what I did to you. We've got a pennant here from Jamaica versus Argentina uh, in Paris, 21st of June, 1998. Uh, Jamaica nil, Argentina five, I believe, was the final score. Uh, but we won't dwell on that. From Group H, that's fantastic. So that would have been in the uh, in the merchandise stands on the day, I would imagine. I hope so. I hope for so, for yeah. collectors to uh, uh, to take. Ah, oh, that is um, that's almost, I think, gear stick of the car worthy. So I can show oh, it wow. off. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm thinking. I'm getting a new motor soon as well. So that might just be the uh, the top of it that it desires. Uh, oh, brilliant. I'm, I'm made up with that, mate. Thank you so much. Oh, no worries. Thank That's you. fantastic. I, of course, no, it's your favourite World Cup and uh, Jamaica, one of your favourite national Absolutely. teams. Absolutely. So we've gone heavy with the with the football gifts so far. It's going to be a football heavy episode, this one, I yes, think. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, but this last gift for you might uh, change that slightly. It says, please do not bend. They've underlined a not, just in case you read that and thought, please do bend. Um <laughs> Uh, and it says, open with care, smiley face. Mm -hmm. I'm doing just that. Let's see what it is. Uh, oh, well, I, I immediately see the uh, the stern look of Wes Borland, my guitar idol, and uh, the bassist Sam Rivers, both from the band Limp Biscuit, on what appears to be an absolutely enormous uh, <laughs> Limp Biscuit poster. 
from Kerrang. Oh, that's good. Oh, and on the back, it's got a, a gurning, a gurning <laughs> Fred Durst um, getting up close and personal with the camera. Wearing uh, a very his... fashionable um, Kangol bucket hat there. Yes. Uh, as well. Fashionable for the time. Oh, that is brilliant. Well, there's actually another one. Let me get the other one. Oh, hello. Oh, and then it's the bottom half of uh, Fred Durst on the other side. Oh, I see that links up with the other one. Oh. So I can actually make... Right, what's this? And that that's A3, A2, <laughs> A1. What do you get if you combine two A1? So I suppose that's A0. A0 is, yeah. I can make an A0 poster to fill one of my walls um, <laughs> of Fred Durst. But the... Uh, that is fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem at all. I'm, I'm glad to um, to have provided a couple of things to go on your wall there, along with the, the Norwich third shirt I can see hanging up behind you. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Fantastic. No, no, I'm really pleased to like it. And thank you for mine as well. Um, they're going to be um, displayed proudly, used often, and it will be a, a great reminder of, of two years on the air. So, so, no, thanks very much. Yeah. Happy birthday, mate. And to you. But it's not just about presents, is it, Stu? Because we're also going to be announcing our birthdays honours list. Correct. Yes, we couldn't have a birthday pass without dishing out some gongs. Um, and I think we've got a bit of a cabinet reshuffle uh, in our thoughts as well, haven't we, for a couple we of these? We have, yes. Um, so it's always been the case with the pod ledger and the titles of the pod that you can't hold more than one position at a time. And so because of that, we've moved a couple of people around for various reasons. So the exciting announcement is that we have three new Legends of the Pod to add to the existing list, which is, of course, Kate Pro, Tim Park and Lee Burnsy Burns, the three mm -hmm. Legends of the Pod. And we are doubling our numbers with yeah, three new three new names. Um, do you want to say who the first person is? Well, the first one, um, moving over from being the official dad of the pod, um, he's lobbied us long and hard for this. So we're pleased to announce that my dad, Glenn, who has been a frequent guest on the pod, uh, is now moving up to full legend status. So congratulations, Glyn. Uh, welcome to the pantheon of greats. Um, and that does leave Dad of the Pod open, I suppose. Um, but I think yes. he'll be happier with Legend of the Pod than uh, you know than Dad of the Pod. I think he'll be he'll be very happy with that title and, and thinking himself very deserving of it, no doubt. <laughs> so uh, so it's our it's our pleasure to to elevate you to uh, to godlike status. Yeah, absolutely. Well deserved. Uh, I do know someone who may be interested in the official dad of the pod position. Um, I will put some inquiries in and, uh, and see okay. what's what. But, um, yeah, let us know what yeah. happens with that. OK, just make sure everything's on the level and done properly. There's no, you know, envelopes full of cash and things like that. You know, we no. want to make sure that this is all all done correct. Of course. Yeah. Jeff will be involved. So he'll keep uh, yeah. a careful eye over all the proceedings. Um, <laughs> So the next new legend of the pod is someone who has sent us in a huge amount of fantastic correspondence over the last two years, um, especially over the last year, and yeah, has really brightened up our mailbag every episode. Uh, and I am, of course, talking about Hannah Kelly Fletcher, who is going to be our next legend of the pod. Um, fully deserved, I think. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, welcome on board. Yeah, absolutely no argument there. Um, thank you, Hannah, for everything you've sent in to us over the last couple of years. Uh, please do keep it coming as well and uh, fully deserving of legendary status. Yeah. And our third legend then, Stu, do you want to announce who that is? Yeah, it's uh, somebody else who's um, kept the correspondence rolling. Um, pretty much every episode he's managed to get in touch with with something that we've been able to read out and, uh, and enjoy. Um, so it's a privilege to elevate uh, my friend and current official Alex of the pod, uh, Alex Mitchell to legendary status. Um, he's been with us since the very start, I think, um, and, and has been and has been sending the correspondence in ever since. Um, so, yeah, more than happy to uh, again to, to add him to the list of greats and more than deserving. So welcome, Alex. Does that mean now that you become the official Alex of the pod? By default, yeah. By Unlike default, the yeah. dad of the pod, where that's now an open position for new applicants or new for anyone, basically, mm -hmm. the Alex one automatically reverted to me um it's sort of complicated to explain i won't go into yeah, details yeah. here but i am now the official answer of the pod um, automatically mm -hmm. so that is our birthday honors lists if you ever want to put forward any um nominations or anyone who you think should be deserving a position or maybe you want to put yourself forward that's generally frowned upon you know it doesn't <laughs> get you very far as, as we learned with um with glenn over the past yes, year indeed. or two um but if someone wants to nominate 
you or or you want to nominate someone else and please do get in touch and we'll we'll consider you for the for the next birthday if we get there yeah it's very much the same sort of stature and kind of organization as the pride of britain awards i would say mm, you know yeah, you wouldn't yeah. you wouldn't nominate yourself for a pride of britain award you know somebody would have to do that mm. for you um so so very much so yes uh, people um coming in and and trying to get themselves at the top table uh, very much frowned upon. Glenn is the exception that proves the rule. Basically, we've only done it to to stop him talking about it, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our guest tonight is a well-respected goalkeeping coach who mentored the first team number ones at Swindon Town, Exeter City, Walsall, Forest Green Rovers, Oldham Athletic and Coventry City before his most recent transfer to Crawley Town. Tonight, though, as it's the off-season, he's here to provide insight into some of the most iconic goalkeeping moments of the 90s. It's an honour to welcome to the show, Steve Hale. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Evening, Alex. Evening, Stu. Hi, mate. Thanks so much for coming on tonight. I really appreciate it. No problem at all. So I, I suppose we have to start with um, with the great escape at, at Crawley at the, end of, at the end of last season. That must have been a great thing to be involved with. Um, I'm not sure if great's the right word, to be honest with you. I chose Crawley, probably but predominantly because of the fact the manager, Scott Lindsay, I've worked with him before, so I already had that relationship with him. I knew it was going to be difficult because the team were obviously down towards the bottom of the table, but I still felt that, you know, we, we'd be able to go in there and have an impact and, and you know, keep them up as such. But we, we managed to pick up a couple of results and then had the big one against Hartlepool away, which... To travel that distance, people don't understand how difficult that is in itself. Just the the the, the difficulty with the the travelling, the tiredness. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was difficult. But we went to Hartlepool, big crowd on the day, um, and we managed to beat them two 0 which was a which was a major turning point for us. We drew with um, Walsall on the penultimate day, and and that was enough to to keep us up. But um, yeah, it was a crazy. It was a crazy situation. Probably the most stressful situation I've been in. I've been at the top end of the table. I've been promoted out of the National League with Forest Green. I was in a relegation battle when I went to Warsaw for a short period of time. But I wouldn't say I've experienced anything like the experience I've had with Crawley trying to stay up. So yeah, it, it was um, it was quite a tough time, and um, I'm certainly enjoying my off season now. <laughs> I bet. Wow, what an absolute roller coaster. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, so that's that's summed up nicely where you are at the moment yeah. um, in in your in your career and your in your football uh, footballing life. But obviously, we're a podcast about the '90s, so we want to rewind to um, well, let's rewind to 1990 and, and talk a bit about your playing career as well. So, I suppose you would have been sort of picking up and starting to play in goal around the late '80s, early '90s. Yeah. Um, so, so how did you? Yeah, how did that all get started? I'm 50 now, um, so I was born in '72. So I'd have been about 18, obviously, at the start of the 90s. Um, so in terms of playing, obviously, like you do as a kid, you you, you know, start playing down the park, start playing for teams. It, it was It is a bit different to sort of now, because obviously you see teams now and like, I don't know, under sixes and ridiculous things like that. Um, but I think my earliest memory was, apart from the school team, I think I remember playing for Crick Lane under 12s. Um, that's the earliest I can remember sort of playing um, proper organised football. Uh, in terms of, I suppose, the 90s, I'm trying to get, remember the running order, really, but I played for a lot of the clubs in the local area, obviously Purton, Wooden Bassett, Highworth, um, in terms of like sort of Hellenic League football. Um, then I had a spell in the Western League with Cowan, with Larkall, which is probably my most enjoyable spell. Um, and then when I started to get to the age where I was sort of, I think I was early, just sort of touching 30, early 30s, and I started to pick up a couple of injuries, and and then I went to Wantage, and I sort of ended up getting involved more in the management side of the game. But in terms of playing time, yeah, um, I certainly did the rounds of the local clubs. Okay, Steve, so that's that's sort of what you were, were doing in the 90s in terms of your playing um, and coaching. But how about when you were watching football? Did you have any sort of favourite goalkeepers who you were looking up to, or or, or maybe outfield players? But yeah, who who were you looking up to uh, and enjoying at the time? Yeah, I, I wasn't. I've never really been overly fussed about the outfield side of the game. Um, I, although I did my outfield badges and I've been an assistant manager, um, goalkeeping has always been my passion and desire and uh, hunger. Um, but yeah, definitely. Probably the big ones for me, Neville Southall, absolutely loved Neville Southall to bits. Um, he was definitely one of my heroes. 
um, Peter Schmeichel, obviously. Um, those those two were probably the top two. Um, there are a number of others that um, that I did enjoy watching, but I would definitely say Neville Southall and and Peter Schmeichel. I think obviously the game has definitely changed, particularly for a goalkeeper. And obviously back in the nineties, everything about goalkeeping was was really about shot stopping, making saves. Um, you know, the modern game is all about playing with your feet as well now. Um, and obviously dealing with crosses is important, but. I think back then, just everybody judged a goalkeeper on keeping the ball at the back of the net. Um, and, and although the game has moved on, I, I actually, that's still for me, the the biggest part of the game for a goalkeeper. I, I, you know, as I say, goalkeepers are required to play with their feet a lot more now, but I would still maintain the biggest priority is keep the ball at the back of the net. And so around that time, just some of the saves that Neville Southall made was just absolutely ridiculous. And And for a guy who was... It was quite a physical size, should we say. You wouldn't have called him a, um, you know, a, a toned, muscular adonis <laughs> or anything like that. Um, he was very rough and ready, um, but he just made some ridiculous saves and, and um, big saves, big moments of the game, just so athletic and powerful. And then obviously as, as sort of the time moved on and Peter Schmeichel came more to the fore in the English game, again, just a different breed a different character just so vocal and aggressive with his back line but again had that ability to just make huge saves in games uh, and and a slight obviously a slightly different style a foreign style that perhaps we hadn't seen before lots of blocking type saves that you know we probably think about in futsal which has become more um predominant in the game um you know the big starfish where he would come out and just spread himself wide and take one in the face or the chest which was again starting to come more into the game shall we say but those two i would say were probably the biggest ones that i would watch and and um really admire but you know there, there's a host of others you know like bruce grobler again his his style was was quite crazy at times and obviously he took a lot of risks and he would take criticism for mistakes but to be honest, like the amount of crosses he would come for, like he was bound to make the odd mistake just because of the the, the quantity that he would come for and the distances he would try and come and take crosses, which we probably hadn't seen before. He was quite eccentric, but again, he would really, you know, catch your attention watching him play. Um, but even, you know, in, in the English game, you know, there was obviously David Seaman, Tim Flowers, Nigel Martin, um, all great goalkeepers. And, you know, you talk about iconic moments, uh, you know, probably one of my iconic moments is the is the FA Cup save for David Seaman, where the ball's you know virtually behind him in the back of the net. And he's somehow and again, bearing in mind, he's a big man. He somehow managed to turn his body and get back and sort of scoop that ball out midair with the right hand, a big, strong right hand to keep that ball out. For me, that's one of the iconic moments of the game. Um, and uh, I remember them, they used to do produce a video. I think it was called, that's how old it is, videos. <laughs> um, I think it was called Greatest Saves. And I think it's sort of Saves Galore, it was called. And I think I've got yeah. three years, three years worth. And it was just literally a video with probably about 60, 70 minutes of just saves across the across that that particular season. And I would just love watching that. And that, that used to inspire me as a young goalkeeper, just watching those. All of those Saves Galore VHSs are on YouTube. And it, it won't oh. surprise you to hear that I've watched those quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Neville Southall's in them a lot. Yeah, absolutely. He very, very much is. He very much is. Um, Alex, go on. Who, who have you got in mind? I mean, we can probably tell from your shirt uh, that we discussed earlier, but, um, but who are you yes. going to talk about? My favourite footballer of all time, I think, not just goalkeepers, not just of the 90s, but of all time is probably George Campos. So he's he's definitely my number one. He Just his crazy playing style. The fact that he also played outfield sometimes, I just love that sort of versatility. <laughs> he was pretty diminutive for a goalkeeper. I think he was maybe five foot seven or something like that, um, but very quick on his feet. So he'd sort of always dash off his line. Um, and try and intercept the the attackers before it got to anywhere near his goal. Uh, and it was just a real character. And, of course, the kits, just most famously in World Cup 94, where he um, sort of burst onto the, the scene and, and entered the public consciousness. But definitely him would be my number one. And then Brian Gunn, being a Norwich fan as I am, big Brian Gunn was like the first keeper I ever saw and, and, and inspired me to start playing a goal. Which is that was the first thing, uh, the first position I played in when I started playing football. I, I, I stopped doing it in later life because I was way too afraid of getting hit in the face. 
but back then when I was a kid, I, I lost playing goal and Brian Gunn was was my icon along with George Campos. I do occasionally speak to Brian actually because Brian's a football agent now, so occasionally okay. I speak to Brian. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, you had the chance to speak to him yourself, didn't you, Alex, last year? I did, yeah. I saw you failed tra- to take it. I saw him in a travel lodge and I, I bottled it. I didn't I didn't know what to say to him. <laughs> you know, they say, he's a, nice, he's a really nice guy. You should, have, you should have spoke to him. He'd have chatted to you, I'd imagine. <sighs> yeah, I know. Well, you know, never, you never know. Maybe I'll bump into him again. He's he's easily <laughs> recognisable in a crowd, so. <laughs> and now, of course, his son is uh, Norwich's number one. So, mm-hmm. But they, they'd be my, my two main keeper idols I think uh what about you Stu uh well uh, there can only be one for me and it might not surprise you to well it won't be a surprise to listeners of the pod but I've gone for um I've gone for Mark Bosnich um hero role model uh a favorite goalkeeper of all time uh, I've actually got a couple of things to show and tell here um, which I've dug out of the old uh, memory box from underneath the bed um so here I am at Villa Park in the uh in the car park there meeting the man himself that's after Villa won Leeds nil, August 97, getting the old autograph book done there. Uh, and then I sent a birthday card for him to the ground the year after that, you know, Mark Bosnich, Villa Park. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and about six months later, I got a signed uh, Adidas Finger Safe promotional postcard, which I've kept wow. ever since as well. Um, so, I mean, the story about how I've how I've become a Villa fan is, um, is is much trodden on the pod, so we won't go over that again. But, um, but obviously, then I, I, I latched on to uh, to Mark Bosnich as as my my favourite player in the team, and and again, like you, Alex, is the reason I, I started playing in goal myself as well. Um, I remember clearly we spoke about our our holidays uh, of the nineties on the last pod, Steve, and we we would see. Uh, I was talking about a trip I took to the Netherlands. Um, and on the way back, I remember clearly being in the car on the way back from the airport when it came over the radio on the news that he'd been arrested the night before his wedding in a strip club in Birmingham <laughs> for some sort of incident that happened. Is this, um, is this why he's your role model? No, 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 nothing like that. No, 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 absolutely. Just, just, uh, you know, just, just the footballing skill, definitely. Right. Um, and another thing which I, which I've forgotten about is that he um, obviously played for Australia uh, national, internationally, um, scored one international goal for Australia in a World Cup qualifier against the Solomon Islands, which it was one of those things that you I read about it in like the front pages of Shoot, like oh Mark Bosnich scored a goal last week and it was a big you know funny thing, and it took me years to to find some footage on it. It's on YouTube now, but it took me years to actually track it down and find it and watch him score this penalty. Um, <laughs> It was BL. They were already 12 nil up, I think. I think they won the game 13 nil, and they got a penalty in the last minute and they invited him up to take it. Follows me on Twitter now as well. We've had a couple of, of Twitter, um, Twitter, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Interactions Changes. as well. Yeah. So, so I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, and yeah, it has to be, um, it has to be Mark Bosnich for me. Probably a, you've already mentioned him, Steve, but a, a nod to Bruce Grobbler, I think, as well, just for the, he was obviously still around in the 90s, probably playing for Southampton by the time that I, you know, sort of started watching football and, and knowing what was going on, really, to have this um, maverick, you know, Zimbabwean with the bald head and the moustache still doing the the things that he did and coming for the crosses and everything else in his sort of winter of his career, not winter, autumn of his career, was was something really notable to me as well. But um, but no, as far as it goes, there is only one number one for me, and that's uh, that's Mark Bosnich. What about say specific saves then, or or, or moments? Or of any sort involving goalkeepers, uh, Steve. Are, are there any that stand out for you? Um, I think, as I mentioned, the the one by by David Seaman in the FA Cup. I think it was at Sheffield United. I think in the FA Cup. Yeah, and I think he was about thirty eight or thirty nine at that point as well. Yeah. So he was yeah. And so to, to make that save then was um, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if there's like one apart from that one. I think there's a number again. If you go through like a highlights reel of like the Schmeichel saves, there, there's a few there that I can remember. I think it was a European game where there was a header at the back post and it was a downward header, and he's he's managed to get back across to his right, almost Gordon Banks esque in terms of the ball's bouncing up. He's got a strong right hand on it and managed to flick it up and over the crossbar, which was an unbelievable save. But uh, yeah, there was just so many. I just think the David Seaman one stands out for me. But there was just so many, particularly by well, not Neville Southall uh, and David Seaman, Peter Schmeichel. It's hard for me to to pick out, you know, two or three real prime examples. To be honest, there was just so many of them. As I say, Schmeichel kept, you know, although United were obviously a really good side, he he did keep them in the in the games at um, at key moments. Um, and yeah, just 
just made saves that would just leave you sort of wow. But yeah, but there was just so many saves at that particular time because, like I said earlier, like everything in goalkeeping then was about making saves, whereas the game has changed now and it doesn't seem to be as much about that. But that, I think that's why I like that era particularly because you could just solely focus on on that shot stopping element of it, really. Yeah, yeah. They call it the moustache era, don't they? Because <laughs> yeah. you had your Seaman, you had your Grobola. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, someone who I'm about to mention actually, but um, well, maybe I'll mention it now actually. Um, so yeah, one of the the iconic saves I was thinking of or immediately came to mind when I thought of the '90s was Rene Higuita's scorpion oh. kick, um, against England while clearing across from Jamie Redknapp in '96. I think it was. It was a friendly anyway. Sort of immortalised, I think, in in the intro to they think it's all over the quiz show. Definitely an iconic save of the 90s, I think. Uh, I don't think I saw... I may. I think I, maybe I did see it live, actually. I remember talking about it in school the next day, so... Red Nat. Goodness me, have you ever seen anything like that in your life from a goalkeeper? <laughs> that is quite the most remarkable piece of goalkeeping I have ever seen. I never tried to, to recreate it. Did either of you ever try and do a scorpion kick? <laughs> I think I'd break my neck if I tried it. <laughs> yeah. It's, he's actually done it a couple of times, hasn't he, Gita? There's footage of him doing it against some other team. But I don't he, know if he's ever done it, tried to do it and failed. But isn't I, the one also that, haven't I seen footage of him? I think it's him who's like come out of his box, started dribbling the ball. And is he, was he the one that ran down the wing and actually got a shot in from like 20 yards out? I'm sure there was a goalkeeper that did that. I, uh, I know what was, you mean, yeah. Mm. yeah well, Higita famously tried to dribble out and tried to do a step over and then got tackled by Roger Miller, I think it was. Yes, and then indeed, got, yeah. Got um, Colombia knocked out of Italian 90, yeah. So, um, he's, I, yeah, he's, there's definitely footage of him failing at something, yeah. if not a scorpion <laughs> kick. And, and and talking of David Seaman, another big save for me was the penalty save against Gary McAllister at Euro 96, yeah. um, England against Scotland. That penalty obviously potentially swung the, the whole match and therefore the whole tournament um, towards England. And yeah, saved it with his elbow. I remember that. I remember watching that live. Mm-hmm. So it was another big one. Have you scrutinised the footage and seen the ball move slightly just as Gary McAllister's about to kick it? Yeah, that was Yuri Geller, wasn't it? It was Yuri Geller in a helicopter above Wembley. Yes, yes. indeed. Using his all of his power to move the ball. But yeah. the ball does move. It's, it's unequivocal. It does move. Um, yeah. So who knows? Who knows? But yeah, certainly. And, and you know, along with his penalty saves in uh, in the... Spain shootout as well. Um, yes, definitely sure. uh, iconic moments there for sure from Euro 96. Um, I'm going to go for another David Seaman moment, but I'm going to go not for a great save, but for not a mistake, but a famous, famous incident. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to say this firmly on the side of the goalkeepers union here. I want to talk about Naeem from the halfway line um, in the 95 Cup Winners Cup final. Interesting result from the qualifiers while I was researching this um, over two legs. Norma Tallinn of Estonia won, Maribor of Slovenia 14 uh, in the qualifiers there. So there's a, there's one for the books. Um, but yeah, so for balance, I think, you know, we need to we need to also include moments where things maybe haven't gone gone uh, gone as correctly as, as we'd like them to. But as a goalkeeper, I feel I can do that. Um, it just has everything. You know, they're the defending champions. They've got to the final again. It's the last minute. It's going to a penalty shootout. It's an ex-Spurs player who just who just takes a shot from 40, 45 yards and it absolutely flies in. And and David Seaman has done absolutely nothing wrong. He's in the correct position. He's, he's tactically playing, you know, how he should be playing. Um, and he just absolutely arrows in. I first learned about this. It, it's a clip that's featured heavily in, in again, another VHS called um, Danny Baker's Fabulous World of Freak Football. Um, I don't, don't know if either of you have, have ever watched this before, but um, that, that was featured quite heavily. And it's, it's quite a good bit, actually, because um, Danny Baker's presenting it and he says, look, we've had a lot of letters in people who want to see David Seaman getting beat from 45 yards. But we don't want that. We all know what happened. It, oh, go on then. And, they, and then they show it about seven or eight different times. And the, um, the commentary, Martin Tyler, can you believe what you've seen? Just <laughs> is another one that sticks in the mind. Um, but just just that it, everything that the goalkeeper puts on the line when he goes out there is encapsulated in that one moment for me, you know. I know, you may have noticed one extremely glaring omission from that pile. 
It was the boondoggling Naeem 50-yarder that ripped out Arsenal's hearts in the 120th minute of the 1995 Cup Winners' Cup final. And the reason we didn't include it is because, well, it, it's perhaps too familiar, isn't it? I mean, you can only see that so many times. We know what happened. We don't... We, we, no, we'll go on then. Well, we're heading for a penalty shootout. Naeem! Or are we? Can you believe what you've seen? Naeem, once of Spurs, has taken the Cup Winners' Cup, surely, from Arsenal for Zaragoza. Seaman went back and back, but it's in, and Arsenal are beaten. You haven't done anything wrong, you're in the right position. And this shot just comes in from miles out, which couldn't be any more perfect, and um, and, and wins the cup final in, in the 119th minute. And and David Seaman is the person that gets focused on rather than rather than the goal scorer. Um, but that's that's uh, that's the nature of the beast with goalkeeping, isn't it? Yeah. Um, another line from the uh, from the video. Sorry, another line from the video is Danny Baker saying at the end, "Don't forget Arsenal. We're la laughing at you. We're laughing towards you." Um, which I'm not sure I really understand, but me and my dad have said that ever since when, when something's gone wrong. Don't worry, we're not laughing at you. We're laughing towards you. Oh, that's a good um, one. <laughs> um, so there you go. That, that, that's mine. David Seaman in the, in the Cup Winners' Cup final. If, if you'll allow me to talk about something just two years over the boundary into the 2000s. So if you think Seaman wasn't at fault for that one, what about the Ronaldinho at um, World Cup 2002? Um, I, was gonna ask, I couldn't remember what year that would have been. I think it was at a World Cup in 2002, wasn't it? Yeah, so, I, th I think we can discuss this. Yeah, I was in the Corsham School Hall at 6.30 in the morning watching it on the on the big screen in the hall. Yeah, I remember that well with uh, Legend of the Pod Alex Mitchell, funnily enough, who'd stayed at my house the night before um, so that we could go down there. But yeah, remember the heartbreak of seeing that sailing. Um, I mean, Steve, as a, as a, as a coach, what's, what's your opinion on it? I just think sometimes that you can... Yeah, even, even the best can get caught out. I think he was sort of positioned more for the ball into the box, the cross. That's probably his mindset. And just sometimes just the trajectory of the ball, the pace of the ball, probably there could have been movement on the ball as well. I think even the best can get caught out. And it's those moments, the main moments, um, they happen in football, don't they? Obviously, Beckham against Neil Sullivan. Um, you know, things like that just happen. And sometimes you have to give credit to the attacker. Sometimes it's just a freak moment. And... I just don't think you can be too critical sometimes of, of the goalkeeper. It will obviously look bad on them, but I think sometimes you also have to sort of just try and give a little bit of credit to the outfield player as well. Obviously, the modern game now, every, you know, any goal goes in, the goalkeeper gets analysed and crucified. Um, but I just think freak moments like that can happen in the game, and that's what makes the game as wonderful as it is, I guess. Um, OK, so we talk about some kits then. It's something Absolutely. Like I would Absolutely. like to talk about in every episode we ever do, but <laughs> we, it's actually suitable for this episode. So, uh, Steve, are there any kits that really stood out for you? Maybe ones you wore or um, just ones that you saw on TV? Yeah, I, I haven't got a picture to, to bring up, but it was an Umbro kit um, and it was, how do I describe it? It was predominantly grey, but it had lots of different flashes of blue and red. I, I wish I had a picture of it, um, but that was one that, I liked visually and I ended up buying, you know, I think I bought that one for myself because I think, again, it might have been in the 90s, but back in the early days, you had a job to get hold of goalkeeper gloves, goalkeeper tops. Um, you know, it's not like nowadays of the mail order and lots of different shops and everything. But I used to get my gear from a company called Sukan Sports who were based in Reading and they were run by Phil Parks, the ex West Ham and England goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. And at the time, that was probably the only place you could really get gloves and, and things like that. And they were, they had a range of um, kits and things like that. And then I think gradually as time moved on, and again, probably in the 90s, you mentioned Shoot Magazine. I used to get Roy the Rovers, Shoot Magazine and Match Magazine. And often in those magazines, um, Match and Shoot, there would be a, a mail order shop and there would be different um, boot, you know, boots like Patrick, Keegan, Kid. I remember having a pair of those. And and I think back then, I think I probably got one of those Umbro tops from there. So the Umbro one would probably be the one that stands out in my mind. Again, when I was sort of that age, I didn't really, I used to go and rather than like wear the kit that whatever club I was playing for provided, again, it used to be quite Bob basic kits. I would always go and end up buying my own goalkeeping kit because mm -hmm. 
I wanted to feel good and in my eyes look good while I was playing. Um, so I would go and buy my own kit rather than just, you know, whatever kit was at the time, you know, pro star kits and things like that, which I didn't, I wasn't really a big fan of. I would go and buy my own sort of kit and, and say, you just want to feel good about it. And again, but back then, obviously tops were, it was all about being baggy tops then, wasn't it? Nowadays, everyone wants to wear everything skin tight. But back in the nineties, tops were, your kits were actually quite baggy, weren't they? But mm-hmm. yeah, the, um, the Umbro one for me, I, I, say, I haven't got a picture I can put up, but um, there was an Umbro one that I really liked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll try and take out a picture, Steve, if you do, and then send it on to us, and we'll stick it on our social media. And oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'll have a look for that. Yeah. <laughs> it does. It makes me irrationally angry seeing goalkeepers wearing very short sleeves, very tight-fitting goalkeeper tops now, like through winter. I understand a bit more in the summer, but I don't understand why keepers want to do that in the middle of January. It's, um, it's, I think it's an ego thing and a fashion thing, personally. Um, because I couldn't think of anything worse. I'm not saying I wanted because obviously a lot of the goalkeeper tops back then had the big padded forearms, didn't they? And some had the padding on the shoulders. Yeah. I know, you know, perhaps goalkeepers don't want to feel bulky and, and, and heavy in their kits and that, but I I do think it's I think it's more of a fashion thing that, that, that they wear a short sleeve shirt. You know, somebody's started to wear one and all of a sudden, oh, I like that. And because I do think fashion plays a big part in football, you've only got to look at socks, haven't you? All of a sudden now it's the cut off socks, it's rolled up over your knees, all this sort of stuff. Well, again, back in the 90s, it was never anything like that. It was probably short shorts and normal socks and tie ups and everything like that. But um, I, I do think it's a fashion thing. Yeah, I think so. Stu, what about you? Kits? Um Again, this, I mean, we, we've spoken about this in, uh, in our, in fact, our first episode was all about football kits of the 90s. That was what we started on uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but I, I have to talk about, and I'm sure you'll know this one, Steve, when I, when I mention it, um, the, it's an ASICS uh, goalkeeper shirt. And it's the, if I say to you, rainbow shard, do you know what I mean? No, I don't. So, so it's a black shirt, and then there's um, there's different shaped shards on it, and there's uh, then all the shards are, are rainbow coloured. Oh, um, right. So, so Mark Bosnich wore one. Villa had it, but all of the Asics supplied um, clubs had that shirt. So Aston Villa, Leeds, uh, Blackburn at the time, all all their goalkeepers wore this shirt, and um, it, it's pretty iconic for me. And uh, Bosnich also wore it in the. League Cup semi-final win over Tranmere in 1994 when he, I think he saved about three penalties in the shootout um, and then he's, he's carried off shoulder high by the crowd off of, uh, off of the field at the end. So yeah, I, I've mentioned this shirt several times on the pod. I'm still on a lookout for one. So if anybody's got one in the garage, do let me know and I'll give you a fair price. Um, but it's the it's the ASICS Rainbow Shard uh, kit, modelled, of course, by Mark Bosnich. And I'm sure, Alex, you're going to talk about a Jorge Campos kit as well, aren't you? Well, yeah, that that would be my number one. <laughs> all, all the number, all, all of the uh, Jorge Campos shirts that he wore in in World Cup '94, I would would love to own um, one of, or even just a replica. But yeah, that just all the the very many colours of the rainbow that he he was clad in for that. I think stitched together by his grandma, if I remember correctly, but des- <laughs> designed by himself. Um, mm-hmm. And a very weird sizing as well, like really short sleeves, but the sleeves ended sort of halfway down his forearms. They were so baggy mm-hmm. um, and just yeah, the brightest colours you can imagine. And then, of course, in 98, he just wore the away shirt of the ho- of the normal outfield home kit. Or if they were wearing the away shirt, he'd wear the home kit. So he'd sort of do the opposite of the outfield players, which which was interesting. And I'm sort of surprised it was allowed. But there you go. It was a bit more lax, I suppose, the the rules back in the 90s. Um, so I would say that, yeah. I think also the the Schmeichel, the green Schmeichel mid nineties Man United jersey. It's like red with, I mean, green with red, and maybe a bit of orange or something else on it. That's that's the most Man United goalkeeper shirt I, of any era I think I can think of, and so that's an iconic one. Well, I'd have to go for, I think, actually, he's wearing it in the save you were talking about earlier, Steve, the, the one in, I think it's in a European game against Rapid Vienna when he gets down to the right-hand post. Yeah, Rapid the, Vienna. the purple uh, or mauve um, oh, sharp yeah. goalkeeper shirt with the diamond sleeves. He was wearing mauve... bottoms on the night, wasn't he? That's right, that's yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. a cold night in Vienna. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that, that's, that's another shirt I've always fancied, despite obviously not being a Man United fan. But yeah, that, that's another one that I've always um, I've always had a lot of time for. Um, can we talk about gloves quickly? I know, Steve, you obviously now manufacture your own range of gloves, and as a 
as a, a customer of some years, uh, very, very good. They are too. And I'll, I'll, I'll vouch for that on this podcast completely. <laughs> um, but but in the days before you were able to, to manufacture your own gloves as well as buying your own kits, were, what, what gloves were you, were you wearing at the time? Yeah, again, um, the two places I would get gloves from back in the day, because again, obviously, the whole glove industry has taken off, obviously, including myself. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, was again from either Sukan Sports or Don Rogers Sports in Swindon. That was the only places I could find, you know, you could go into a general sports shop and, and come up with some cheap pair of gloves or whatever, but not much of a range. But Don Rogers was always quite good for his range of gloves. Um, but again, back in the day was for me was Sukan Sports and big then, obviously they're still quite big now, but big then was, was all sport gloves. Mm-hmm. Um, and they didn't have names, they had numbers, didn't it? Like all sport 056 or whatever like that. Um, so I would I would certainly um I remember buying a lot of all sport gloves. I was never really a big Roish fan, if I'm honest. Um I think the ones that do stand out for me visually of the Roish ones were like the Peter Schmeichels, the white ones with the with the red across the uh, across mm-hmm. the back hand. Um, but I was never really a Roish man myself, uh, all sport. I did have a couple of pairs of Umbros, and they were the ones that Bruce Grobble I used to wear, like the yellow and green ones. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the really bright yellow and green ones. I remember having a pair of those. But, for, yeah, for me, I, I certainly went through the, the all-sport range because what you'd get with Yusukan Sports was literally, it was, a, I say, a catalogue. It was hardly a catalogue. It was literally sort of like two or three A4 sheets. And on the front cover was like literally the whole of the sheet was – all these tiny pictures of all the range of gloves and then on the inside it was like goalkeeper tops padded goalkeeper shorts and glove bags and things like that i remember getting a, a ray clement sondaco red and white glove bag um and i had a yellow umbro glove bag as well but in terms of the gloves yeah definitely all sport for me well it's funny you say you're not you weren't much of a royce fan because i've got another show and tell here um i removed them from the wallet very carefully um but i've got some original Gore Windstopper Royce is there with the uh, with the Windstopper inners and outers, which you can't wear in the summer um, because they're just impossible in the summer. Um, but that's one of my favourite gloves from the 90s. Uh, goalkeepers like Ian Walker, I think, what, used to wear them. And I think Seaman wore them as well. Um, and I managed to find a pair online a few years ago with a, with a new palm. So, so it's an original backhand and a new palm. Um, but, but yeah, I did, I did, and I had a pair of the um, of the Schmeichel gloves with his with his actual name on the on the strap yeah. as well. Obviously, just to sort of uh, it's a big uh, S, wasn't it? It was a big that's S, right? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Not not professional grade, more more yeah, you know, uh, children's market, I suppose. But but I definitely had a pair of those. Um, Alex, when you were in the sticks, what what gloves did you wear? Can you remember? I had some Norwich City ones from the club shop. Oh, um, superb! Which were lovely. I, I wore them. Constantly. I would wear them even if I wasn't playing football. I loved them so much. But <laughs> before that, I had some, like, I guess they were just kids ones, but they were the ones that were sort of, they weren't like proper goalkeeping gloves. They were just more like fabric that had, each thing would have a little strap, a little strip of, um, like, mm-hmm. tougher material sewn on and the same on the back. And they just, yeah, I wore them so much they fell apart. And they obviously weren't <laughs> made that strongly. But this was, I mean, when did goalkeeper gloves change to become, like, what they are now? Because there was a period when I suppose they were just, more like a cloth based mm-hmm. material i think all sport were probably the first weren't they yeah they they were the leaders really weren't they it was obviously all sport and roish umbro started to come into the market um but for a number of years those were probably the only ones out there and obviously now everybody does a goalkeeping glove um but i couldn't tell you what when it sort of started to change and obviously now it's um you know it used to be like a lot of the gloves were just fairly predominantly white but now obviously colours have come into it and now as we move forwards it's um I suppose it's the marigold style glove that um <laughs> Adidas and Nike do but yeah I'm not sure quite sure when it really changed dramatically but certainly back in the 90s it was just different slightly different styles but of a similar sort of build to the glove I think with the all sport ones right um shall we finish off by talking a little bit about how much we think goalkeeping has changed since the 90s it's changed massively, even down to, well, but the, the thing that I suppose in terms of the distribution side, when I played, everything was like when you had the, you didn't really play out from the back with your feet or anything like that. It was get the ball forwards. You kicked a lot out of your hands rather than off the deck. And like for me, it was like the old school, either up and under straight forwards volley, or I used to quite like the drop kick, the half volley. 
and and I used to like that and get it nice and flat and quick into your front men. But that obviously now everything is the side volley, isn't it? And you don't see many goalkeepers now that do actually hit that half volley. And I, I, I struggle to master it myself. It really is quite a difficult technique, but everybody does that. And I don't necessarily think it's always for the best. I, I still think a drop kick can be just as good, if not more effective, because it's a slightly easier technique, I think, than a side volley. So if you get the side volley wrong, it can be horrendous. It can You can shank it straight into the floor or you can get underneath the ball and it skies it up in the air. And, and there are, you know, goalkeepers that are good at doing it, but I also think there's goalkeepers that try to do it and are not very natural at doing it. It looks horrendous. But I think, and again, in terms of distribution, like you used to have goalkeepers, and I used to love it, goalkeepers that had a good throw on them. So again, Peter Schmeichel with a, with a great throw. Because of the whole side volley thing is no one seems to want to throw the ball anymore. Um, one of the goalkeepers I work with at Warsaw, Liam Roberts, who's now at uh, Middlesbrough, he's had a fan, he's got a fantastic throw. And I, when I was at Warsaw, I used to try and encourage him to do it more because it, he could get such great distance, but also he could get it there with speed. But yeah, like I say, back in the 90s, I think you were judged on shot stopping, making saves. Um, yeah, crosses was part of it, but certainly distribution wasn't part of it, really. Um, it was very, you know, quite basic. Keeper gets the ball, teams get up the pitch lump it up the pitch and now obviously it's it's completely gone the opposite way and everything is about playing out from the back or it's hitting a nice little side volley so that's definitely changed um i think the footballs the modern footballs move ridiculously um again back when i was playing you were probably talking about the mitre deltas the mitre multiplexes and you knew you knew if you got hit by a mitre multiplex that really did sting <laughs> but those footballs back then were probably a bit heavier but now everything has got this real shiny plastic coating on it. They're so much lighter. It is ridiculous how much the ball moves. And, and I've noticed it both from a coaching point of view when I'm striking at the goalkeepers. Um, and, and like sometimes I try to like knuckle ball it like a Ronaldo and I can get some movement on it. And sometimes even just striking the ball naturally, the ball will move. And the goalkeeper looks at me and well, how do you manage to do that? And I said, and I, I say, like, I haven't meant to do it. It's just the football. The way is the way it moves. But I went, I went in. I stupidly, we were. I was at Exeter, and we played Swindon at the county ground towards the end of the season. And um, Lewis Ward was no, sorry, Johnny Maxted was the goalkeeper. He was due to start. Lewis Ward was on the bench, and Johnny got was carrying an injury, and he got injured again in the warm up, so he couldn't start the game. So Lewis was starting. But that meant he had to do his little bit of the warm-up, then go in. So it left no goalkeeper for the pre-match shooting. So I just thought, oh, yeah, I'd go and stand in the goal. And I'm not going to dive around lots, but I'll stand there and try and make the odd save for the strikers to finish. Oh, my days. Um, <laughs> I know I'm getting on a bit now, but I stood doing that in that goal. And the pace, it's one thing me coaching and seeing players doing it and me striking at the goalkeepers, but actually stand in that goal and face Randall Williams for Exeter at the time, unbelievable the pace they struck the ball. There was one time I've actually tried to get out of the way and it's hit me. Um, <laughs> but like the pace of the ball is crazy. The movement on the ball is crazy. So I have a lot of sympathy now when a goalkeeper gets beat and you've got these pundits, particularly outfield players on Sky and everything like that, crucifying the goalkeeper. I just think until you've stood in that goal and you've faced shots, particularly in the modern game, You've got no idea or appreciation of actually how difficult that is. And yes, they might be professional goalkeepers and should be able to deal with that. But I am telling you, the way the ball can move now, it can make the best goalkeepers look really stupid. So I do think there are elements of the game that's changed in terms of distribution, but there are also elements of the game in terms of the finer detail of the actual ball itself and the way the ball moves and travels that have, have changed. Because obviously the game is such that, that people want goals scored. So, you know, these footballs are being made so that more goals will be scored. But as you can imagine from the goalkeeper's point of view, it, it, it's a killer for mm -hmm. goalkeepers. Mm -hmm. Well, we've reached the end of another pod episode and come to the conclusion that things were a lot better in the 90s, as we always seem to. <laughs> it was simpler. <laughs> um, Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure having you along tonight. We'll put a link to your website in the, in our description so that uh, any goalkeepers listening can can have a look at your glove range and uh, and maybe make a few purchases. I personally use the Pro Grip Superior. I think it's an excellent glove. Um, but Steve, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Mate. It's been a pleasure having you on. Much appreciated. Love.
Thanks very much, guys. Thanks so much to Steve there for coming on and talking about goalkeeping in the 90s. It's obviously a topic which is very close to you, Stu. I know it's your favourite position and where you play. Definitely. I've been waiting to do uh, a pod on goalkeeping in the 90s basically since we began this. I think I could have spoken for a lot longer than we actually did on the subject just to speak about our favourite players from the 90s and the moments and the kits was was just manna from heaven to me. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And, and thanks so much to Steve for taking time out of his busy schedule um, to come on and speak to us. And all the best to him and Crawley Town for the upcoming season. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to get in touch to tell us about your favourite goalkeepers or your favourite moments of goalkeeping in the 90s, whatever we've talked about in this episode or any previous episodes, please contact us using the usual Linktree link, which you can find in the episode description. And uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. As far as next week, we don't know what we're going to be talking about again. We have some exciting guests lined up for future episodes, but we're not sure what we're going to do next time. So um, no surprise there, but... You know us by now. Like It's like I've said before, trust us. Everything will work out. Don't yeah. worry about it. Yeah, you've been here for two years now. There's, there's no surprises. <laughs> um, but until then, uh, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. I'm just off to slip into a nice, comfortable pair of Royce Gore windstoppers. Goodbye. Ta-ta.